Hi, I'm Jake from vikinghistory.com. In today's video, we'll be making a pair of woolen hose based on a collection of textile fragments that were found during the early and high medieval period. One of these textile fragments was actually found at the Hedeby Harbor settlement in Viking Age Denmark. We'll use that as the basis to make these hose. In just a minute, we'll talk a little bit about some of these pieces of footwear that were found during the Viking Age all the way through the high medieval period. We'll also talk about how to take your measurements, how to dye your fabric, how to make a twall, and then how to put it all together to make sure that these are custom fit just for you. Before we jump in, I do just wanna make a comment. I started dyeing this fabric months ago because the fabric that I used in this project was actually for two separate projects, a tunic and these pair of hose. So you might see my beard and my hair get a little longer or shorter throughout the video. No, I don't have a twin. I just cut my beard and my hair quite often. As I mentioned before, we're gonna be using the textile fragments that were found at the Hedeby Harbor settlement as an inspiration for these hose. The reason that we are making these early medieval hose is to go along with our Danish Viking persona, and more specifically, to go with all the other outfit items that we're making for the Hedeby Harbor kit. If you haven't already, check out this book, The Viking Dress Code by Kamal Rabiega. I'm sure I'm butchering his name every time I pronounce it, but he does talk a lot about the different textile fragments that were found at each of these locations and the assumed garments that they would have been a part of. He mentions these hose specifically. He says, men living in the renowned settlement wore hose to protect their feet and their legs, tied and held up with a leather belt. This is confirmed by fragments of three garments of this type uncovered in the harbor and at the settlement. These were made in two over two, twill brown colored wool. One of the finds was made of two parts stitched together with a width of 21 to 24 centimeters and preserved in a 29 centimeter long fragment. On the upper edge, there's a hem and a strap for tying the hose. He then goes on to mention that an additional textile fragment had been preserved, which can be interpreted as the sole of such a hose. Now it is difficult to understand if the Hedeby Harbor hose actually had an integrated foot because the lower end of that leg fragment is actually so destroyed and not well preserved that it's hard to know where the garment would have ended. Would it have stopped at the ankle or would it have continued into a foot? Sure, we can assume things based on other textile fragments that were found in the near vicinity and within the same context, but we don't know for sure. If you'd like to make yours without an integrated foot, it's very simple. All you have to do is continue your measurements that I'm about to show you only down to your ankle and cut your fabric so that it's just that long. I've actually made the decision to include the integrated foot to this pair of hose that I'm gonna be making. And I'd like to first talk about three other examples of medieval era hose that do have the integrated foot and where they were found. The first is a woolen hose that was found in a female grave in Matre de Vere in central France. This was dated to around the second century. The second example is also a woolen hose. This was found at a graveyard site at the Norse Hurjolfsnes settlement in Greenland. This one's a bit harder to date. It has quite a wide range between about 1150 to 1530 CE. The third example is probably the best preserved. It's a pair of hose that were found on the bog body of the Boxton Man, which was found in Varberg, Sweden. This date is also disputed, but it was probably somewhere around the 1300s. So as I said, I am gonna go with the integrated foot design and I'll put that pattern down in the description so that you can copy it and follow along. Um, but if you're just gonna go down to the ankle, you can just cut your fabric to that length and you don't have to worry about the foot piece, which is actually a lot easier. I'm also gonna be using some fabric that is undyed, and I'm gonna be dyeing it myself with walnuts to achieve a brown color just like the Hedeby Harbor hose. If you'd like, you can get undyed fabric and dye it yourself along with us, or you can just buy pre-dyed fabric in any color that you like. That's totally up to you. So having said all that, let's get over to our tools and materials to find out what we need to get started. So really all we need for this project is a good pair of scissors, the thread of your choosing, especially if it matches the fabric that you're gonna be making this out of, and some needles for hand stitching. I'm also gonna be doing quite a bit of this on the machine, but that's up to you whether or not you'd like to use a sewing machine or just hand sew everything. 
Now I also have some leather lace there up in the top right hand corner. And what I'm going to be using that for is to actually suspend the hose from the belt of the linen braise that we made in a previous video. If you haven't watched that video, I'll make sure to put a link so you can go check it out. The last part is our two types of fabric. So you can see that I have some brown wool fabric. I love this wool. It's hand woven wool. Uh, if you're someone who really like hates wool because of how itchy it can get, you should check this out. I'll put a link in the description. It's totally worth the price. It's quite pricey, but it's all hand woven, handmade, and it's the exact type of wool that was found at the Hedeby Harbor settlement. So this is a great match for our project. I've also started dyeing this with walnuts, and you'll see that in just a bit in this video, how I go about getting that color. And of course, that second piece of fabric is the gray wool. I just had this lying around. Uh, it's sort of like scrap wool at this point, but what I'm gonna use this for is to actually make a toile, which is a really important part of this process. A toile is basically a rough draft of your garment made out of a cheaper or you know less important fabric. And what you're able to do is sort of pin it together rather than sewing it and try it on and see how it fits. And then you can sort of make little micro adjustments, cuts, uh, maybe repin it in a different position to really make sure that that tailored fit is exactly how you want it. And that's really important if we're gonna be making something that goes over your knee and all the way down to your ankle and has a number of places that can flex and move, especially while you're walking. That's really all that we need. Uh, let's get started. All right, so the first thing that we need to do is determine how high up we want our hose to come. For me, that's about the upper thigh or the pocket area. So that will be my first measurement. And then I'll go on to just above my knee. I'll also then measure just below my knee. And then a really important step in making sure that these are tailor fit, I'll find out where my calf muscle ends and measure there as well. If you want yours to only come down to your ankle, you would stop then with your ankle measurement. But if you want these to have an integrated foot, you have to remember that your foot needs to pass through the same part where your ankle goes. So it's important to measure around your heel and at the top of your foot. All right, so the next step will be to make our toile, which you can see now that I've done out of that gray wool fabric that I've had laying around. And I'll come back in with the measuring tape and just retake all of the same measurements again, making sure that everything fits and articulates the way that I want. And then if it doesn't, what I'll do is go back, unstitch or unpin the toile, and just make those micro adjustments that I mentioned earlier. Once I have all of that done, I will unstitch the toile and use that basically as just a template, a pattern that will stick right onto my wool. And I will use that to cut it out and stitch up the real thing. The next thing that we need to do is to dye our fabric. We know that based on some of the chemical analysis of different fragments found at Hedeby Harbor, that walnut was actually one of the chemicals used to dye wool. The first thing that we need to do is to mordant our fabric. That means that we're gonna take another chemical and add it to our fabric, which will allow the fabric to soak up more of the pigment and give us a better, deeper, and richer color. So all I'm doing to mordant the fabric is just heating up a pot of water, which I'll soak the fabric in, and I'm using alum for my mordant. There's probably better things that you can use, but alum is known to give a richer, more golden color to walnut dye on wool. Now you can see here that I'm using walnut hull powder and I would strongly, strongly advise you not to use this. I learned my lesson the hard way. I think that if I was gonna do this again, I would probably just try to go find fresh walnuts in the fall and try to harvest them that way. If you can't, uh, see if there's a supplier that has walnut hull chunks or pieces. It's a way better way to go. You can see I've probably got maybe two or three layers of cheesecloth and it's still just spilling through. It got everywhere. I essentially had to steep it in the other pot that I was using for a dye bath in order to get the color out of it. But the problem was I ended up with all these little micro pieces of the powder stuck in the fabric even after I had begun dyeing. So it's a real pain. I would advise you not to do it. 
another thing I would advise you not to do is use a pot that is too small for your fabric. I learned this the hard way as well. The best thing you can do is probably just go buy a pot that you can dedicate to dyeing so that you're not using like a, a soup pot from your kitchen. Um, but ultimately, even with those mistakes made, this fabric came out really nice. Uh, all I had to do was rinse it a ton before I gently washed and dried it, uh, which you'll see the color in just a minute. But um, yeah, definitely some lessons learned there. So we have finished dyeing and um, rinsing and gently washing and drying our fabric and I think it's come out great. It's a little bit blotchy in some places and sometimes that's to be expected when you're dyeing with uh, natural pigments. Um, but I also dyed this with walnut hull powder that I bought online. I think I'd recommend that if you have access to actual walnut hulls, uh, or if you're able to find them in the fall, that would probably be a better option. I actually had to dye this twice with the walnut hull powder just to get this depth of color that we have here. And I, and I really like the way that it came out. So yeah, I, I would suggest going with extra walnut hull powder if you can, or finding fresh walnut hulls. And now that we have this really nice dyed fabric, we can take the pieces of our toile and lay them down like a pattern and start cutting out. You can see that I haven't even drawn a line. I'm just using the fabric as a guide. You can really get away with stuff like this when you have wool on wool. I don't know that I would do this with linen or something else, but the wool almost like Velcros to itself, so you can get a pretty even cut. I'm then going to my sewing machine and just doing the larger pieces that I know that I can do, and then some of the fine needlework I'll probably do by hand later on. So all I've done here is basically just taken these larger pieces and the long seams I've done on the machine just because I know I can do that easily. But down here around the ankle, I'm gonna do that by hand. This is essentially the calf up to the knee piece. And then there's another piece that attaches to the top part that goes up to the thigh. And you can see I've already completed that here on the second one, again with that same seam. Um, but we'll need to fell the seams on the inside by hand. And then we'll also need to attach the foot piece, which we'll do a little bit later. I have also done the foot part on the machine, but again, I've left that seam up over the top of the foot and the one that goes around the back of the heel to be done by hand, just because I think it's a little bit more intricate and challenging. So we'll do that for the next one and we'll start sewing these up and eventually we'll have two fully constructed pieces. And what we're looking at here is how that ankle piece is actually going to attach to the foot. Well, we have finished the construction of our hose. I've got some really squeaky leather shoes on because I haven't oiled them yet, but you can see that the hose come right up to about the pocket of where my normal pants would be. So the next step that we have is to actually take this raw edge here up at the top and hem it down. And I may also line this top part 
with another layer of wool or perhaps a layer of linen because the step after that will be to take this leather lace and attach it to the top parts of each side of the hose so that they can attach to the belt that I have right here on the braids. So I wanna reinforce that hole and make sure that these don't actually rip. And I'll probably do that with just another little patch or layer of fabric underneath. But I think they came out great. What I decided on was using some scrap linen to create a uh, liner piece that I basically just traced out of that same upper part of the fabric. And now what I'm doing is I'm just felling all of my stitches around to give it a nice tidy appearance. Now I've also decided to take the top edge of the linen liner fabric and of the wool and roll them inwards facing each other and then hand stitching them together. And ultimately I think what it has produced is a really nice um, authentic handmade look and it hides that seam really well which you can see here from the top. I also reinforced the hole where the uh, cord goes through just with a little bit of hand stitching, so that's a little bit more durable. And uh, yeah, overall, I think it turned out really great. It's got a very unique hand stitched and authentic look, and I'm pretty pleased with how they came out. Well, we finished our hose. That's it for this project. I wish I had more close-up footage, uh, maybe like some more B-roll and some really interesting cinematic shots of me wearing them, but it's an absolute blizzard outside today. So instead what I'll do is I'll put all of this written information and some more close-up images into a PDF that we'll link onto our website. We'll make sure to include that link in the description box below. And if you haven't already, check out some of the other videos in this series. You might find them helpful. Well, thanks for joining us. That's it for today's video. If you found this information helpful, consider giving us a like or share with your medieval-minded friends. Consider subscribing if you'd like to see more from our channel. And if there's something that you think we could have done better or a new topic you'd like to see in another video, let us know in the comments below. We'll also be sure to link this video and all the other videos in this series into a playlist so that you can watch through and make all of these garments along with us to add them to your Viking persona. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.